Good evening. Welcome you all to 92nd Street Y and the Forum on Law, Cultures, and Society's wildly successful Trials and Error season, uh, series. Uh, this one, the Bernard Getz case. Um, we have an audience that's watching this live. We even have, I don't know if you know this, we, Jen forgot to tell you or didn't want to, I think she was leaving it for me. The Jewish channel ordered this. So <laughs> this will be on the Jewish channel as well and the live stream, it's very important. Uh, now, let me tell you why it's important. There's something about Joel Seidman, who, which you may not know. Yes, he's the incredibly brilliant producer of this series, but Joel actually did not, never did have a bar mitzvah. Uh, and he's been using the Trials and Errors series as a way to compensate for that. He gets to do his little thing up there. It's like a tour a bit. And then, you know, he does, he's had four bar mitzvahs, basically. And he'll be outside collecting uh, fountain pens later. <laughs> Um, I don't need to introduce uh, our guests. We've already, Joel has already done it. My good friend Geraldo Rivera is here. Speaking of a Jewish person who's had a bar mitzvah, people don't know this about Geraldo. Oh, Geraldo Rivera. That's, a, that's not his real name. Uh, <laughs> he, you know, he's Jewish and it's important. And the only reason I make a big deal out of it, this is 90 Seconds Street Y, you have to disclose the name of all the Jews on stage. It, it's, 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 in the, it's in the bylaws. You can't get a get away without that. So my, let's... My wife always plays, who's the Jew? <laughs> Geraldo, let's start with you. Uh, was this one of your biggest stories that you covered? And can you give us a sense, I mean, for those of people who don't remember it, what was it like in the city? Uh, what was it like for a media personality to cover this? You know, we think a lot about the OJ trial, which was about six years later, six or seven years later. But at least in New York City, this was galvanizing because it, it seemed to affect everyone in a very personal way. Let, let me first reference something Joel said about the George Zimmerman, Trayvon Martin case. The parallels are incredibly eerie. They are almost exact in both cases. You had a situation where crime was on the mind of the residents. In, in the case of Sanford, Florida, there had been the previous burglaries in the month leading up to the fatal encounter between George Zimmerman and, and the 17-year-old unarmed youngster. In New York in 1984, it is impossible to remember what it was like to take the two train, the, uh, the Seventh Avenue train, every car smeared with graffiti, no transit cops anywhere, and if you did see them, they were partnered up because of the fear they had. Uh, the, uh, the anarchists ruled the city. Uh, homicide was not only a daily occurrence, it was almost a, every two or three or four hours there was a murder in this town. Uh, it was a, a town under siege. Uh, yeah, Koch had uh, become the mayor, but he hadn't really uh, exerted uh, effective control. Uh, there was anarchy. There was incredible, as in Sanford, Florida, many years later, uh, uh, racial suspicions between uh, the black population, the, the minority population, let me say, and the, and the white population. Uh, there was uh, women would not walk alone. Uh, you know, you wouldn't even think to let your teenager take the train. And in the context of all this, remember we had had the blackout riots of 1977, the summer of Sam had happened. In the, in the context of this, you had Charles Bronson and you had the Death Wish movies where that whole notion of vigilantism as heroes had been e developed. So it was very, very easy for the, uh, for the white population particularly, but the, more generally the law abiding or the, uh, the feared, the fearful population to relate immediately to Bernard Getz. The fact that there were four of the black youngsters involved, the fact that it was everybody's nightmare being cornered on the subway. Everyone knew when the first kid said, uh, I want $5, that that was only the prelude to a stick up. Uh, so as I suggest there, Bernard Getz, and with all due respect to Barry, Bernard Getz became a, a fake hero in the sense that everybody invested in him. Uh, if, unless you were uh, the, the parent of a, of a black teenager, just like in the Trayvon Martin parallel, everybody else in this town was rooting for Bernard Getz. So Greg, how, how difficult was it to prosecute this case, given the fact that it was a media sensation case? There may have, in fact, been a media bias and certainly the public was so incredibly invested, especially the New York City public, which is your job to protect. I mean, it's a very interesting, it's, it's, it's twisted from the way we normally think about it. We normally say the prosecutor's job is to fight crime. 
uh, and here you have an urban hero who committed a crime, and the victims were criminals. Um, it, it, it's a great challenge, um, but we as prosecutors have to deal with self-defense issues on a daily basis. Um, we can't pick our victims. Uh, we have to evaluate each case on its own merits, uh, and those that uh, we believe require uh, some kind of prosecution we go forward with, uh, irrespective, I hope, of how the public feels about it. Even though it may have been a tough sell. Uh, I was not involved in the Getz case when it was initially presented to the grand jury. Um, but I was in favor of representing it to the grand jury. I understood it was a tough sell. I thought it was in the interest of justice that the case be decided by a jury uh, such as the one Mark sat on. Uh, and let does that public, mean, does that, pub, sorry. No, I'm sorry. Does that mean that a plea was offered? Barry and I discussed a plea because I think Barry was constitutionally obliged to at least have some conversation before the trial. Barry, I, I recall, perhaps after jury selection, uh, but before the trial uh, actually began, called me and uh, I think more or less said, I'm doing my due diligence. Uh, is there any possible resolution? And um, I, I didn't understand him to be interested in a plea and certainly the, the, the people were not interested in making an offer that Barry's client was likely to accept. But was, we had a, a conversation in passing. Because you know, one could think that perhaps this is just not the right case because of this, this, is, an, uh, this is Charles Bronson come to life in a city that has experienced an incredible amount of urban violence. And as Mark pointed out, stunningly, what kind of a jury pool do you have when 30 people erupt in applause when the defendant uh, uh, appears inside the courtroom? It's, it's an impossible situation for a prosecutor. Three years passed from the time of the shooting until the trial. Um, I think it's fair to say my case did not get better during those three years. Uh, <laughs> But I think uh, the public interest in having a trial, irrespective of the ultimate outcome, was a, an important factor. Uh, and I, I just don't think there was any basis on which the district attorney in Manhattan could settle the case on terms that Barry would find out Was Did Getz actually speak about the possibility that he would accept a plea, Barry? Or did he feel he needed to be vindicated? He thought the, the will of the people were behind him. Based upon the fact that we have an attorney-client relationship, oh, you're gonna, I can't tell you what gets at. Oh, you're going to keep to that privilege. But I will <laughs> tell you one thing. It was clear that the New York Times, who had some influence over this case, wrote articles and editorials. The public must know. Getz must stand trial while they were rooting for his conviction. Uh, and they knew about the videotape confession, which we'll all see shortly. We're going to see it shortly. By the way, Barry, guys, just get number three ready to go. Not yet, but just get it, get it ready. I mean, uh, the trial was an interesting trial. On December 22nd, I was in St. Martin with my wife and children. I got home and my phone was ringing. And it was a friend of mine who said, Bernie Getz needs help. He needs you. And I said, who's Bernie Getz? I had been in St. Martin when he was shooting. I had no clue. He said, well, he's the guy who shot the people on the subway. I said, I don't represent people who shoot people on the subway. Tell him <laughs> to go commit a big white collar crime and I'm his lawyer. He said, you must see him. And I said, no, what's his address? The next day I drove down to the courthouse and on the way I got off the highway, I stopped by his address and there was nothing but cameras. There were people all over the place. Geraldo, your kin, they were there. And I said, this is a case I have to look at. <laughs> <laughs> and the next thing I knew, I was his lawyer. And it was a good thing. It was a real good thing because I hadn't seen the videotape confession. Uh, no one had seen it at that time. And then one morning I got a call from a friend of mine who said, you don't look bad, here's another. And I said, six o'clock in the morning, why are you calling me with silliness? I had no clue. He says, well, get the Daily News. I said, tell me. He said, your client told the police in Concord that 
he said to well, one well, man let, who was sitting there. Right, we're going to watch this, make it more dramatic. Oh, this is okay. the actual, we're going to actually. I, I am not going to tell you, but after you one see second. his confession, tell me how you vote for an acquittal. So this is, uh, just so we'll set this clip up, uh, Bernard Getz rents a car twice. This is the second time. And he goes to, also we've got to point out that Greg uh, uh, Waples flew, uh, drew, drove down from Vermont, which is where he lives now, uh, because there are no subways there. And that he just <laughs> had enough of that. I, I retraced <laughs> Mr. Getz's uh, path. Right. <laughs> so that's right. Getz, Getz goes up to New Hampshire and surrenders to the police department in New Hampshire. And then New York uh, police detectives and a, an assistant district attorney from Manhattan immediately drive up to meet him with a video camera. And this is, this is the pivotal piece of videotape that essentially was the, really the, the most, uh, the most uh, critical evidence that, that, that uh, Greg had for establishing a case of, of, uh, of, of, of first degree murder. This is the truth. This is the truth. You don't understand. I, I, I'm not hiding behind anything. I don't have any attorney here. I'm not going to hide behind that technicality. You're saying, oh, you shouldn't say this, and oh, you shouldn't say that. If the truth isn't enough, if the truth isn't enough, listen, if, 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 if a person has to be reduced to this kind of an animal to survive in the city, if you take a rat, okay, I was vicious. I don't deny it. I, I told the guys, I don't know if it's in this statement, but if you, if you take a rat and you corner it, and you, let's say just one time, you start poking it with, with red hot needles, and the, rat, and the rat doesn't know how to react, and you do this, okay, and you wind up doing it again, or you know, perhaps again, and if once in a while a rat turns viciously on you, and just becomes a total vicious killer, which is which is really what I was. Then don't don't go passing statements of morality, saying, ah, well this was uh, not warranted, or this was uh, you should have uh, done this, or all you had to do was show the gun. I've been in situations where I've shown the gun. What happened here is I snapped. I, sh I, I look. If I had more bullets, I would have shot them all again and again. The old, my problem was I ran out of bullets, and I was gonna I was gonna gouge one of the guy's eyes out with my keys afterwards. You you, you 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 can't understand this. I know you can't understand this. That's fine. The reason the only reason I didn't do it is because he had changed his look. I, I ran up to the first two to check them who were on the ground. The first two that I had shot, and they were taken care of. It's all very cold-blooded, and this is going to offend everyone. I went back to the other two to check on them. And the fellow who was standing up, I was sure I shot him. It was funny. I wanted to give an be honest answer. I want to know if I missed. But I, I, went, I went to him the second time, and I looked at him. And he can't verify this because he was probably out of it by then. If I had shot him or if he wasn't, I don't know. And I said, you seem to be doing all right. Here's another. Wow. Uh, that last piece on the tape, uh, you seem to be doing all right. Here's another. That sounds like prosecutor gold. I mean, this is a case of establishing Barry's claiming this is self-defense. All of his guys are on the floor of the subway. Uh, there's a requirement of a reasonable fear of bodily harm, and there's an imminence requirement, and there's a guy purportedly already shot, and then there's a, a pause, and then you shoot one more time, right? And that essentially the case hinges on that. So uh, Barry asked a question on whether he thought, what did you ask the audience to think when they saw that last line? Put yourself, sorry, Mark, on the jury and decide whether you will acquit him or convict him based upon the videotape. And it gets worse, by the way. There's more of the videotape, which I won't preempt at this point. But you don't look bad. Here's another. Bang! How, how do you get acquitted on that? You get acquitted on that by telling the jury he's lying. Greg, whose entire case was based upon the videotape confessions of Bernard Getz, 
All they had to do was sit back and play those videos. I had to do something with it. And so we called Dr. Udowitz, who was a world famous psychologist. And he told me about what happens to people who are in great stress, who shoot people. What happens to their memory? And he looked at the Getz confession and he said, oh, don't worry about it. No one's going to believe him. He's not telling the truth. He's stuck in automatic pilot. And I looked at Dr. Udowitz as if he was stuck in automatic pilot. And he taught me what that was. And through six hours of summation, I let the jury know what it was. They had heard Dr. Udowitz. And they accepted the fact that Bernard Getz had never said, as he did on tape, you don't look bad, here's another bang. They accepted the fact that Christopher Boucher, who was, a who was a witness in that subway car and who said he heard Bernard Getz say, you don't look bad, here's another bang, that these people were full of stress. And they had no clue as to what really happened. And it was, I think, upon that basis that the jury acquitted him. Because there is no way with these videotaped confessions, and there's more, I wanted to kill them. But unless it's juror nullification, unless this is just ridiculous. Greg, you're listening to Barry say, he took, he says this in, in New Hampshire, but it never actually happened. He embellishes it in front of two detectives and an assistant district attorney. And then when he comes back, Barry tells the jury, well, that didn't happen. It never happened. He, he's, he thinks it happened. By the way, there's another piece of evidence, right, which is that one of the people in the car said that they recall no gap between the fourth and the fifth shot. Rapid succession. Rapid succession. And so there that was my defense. Right. So there wouldn't have been time if that person remembers that it's not four bullets, pause, fifth bullets, but five bullets, then when was there time to say, you look oh fine to me, here's another. So Greg, when you hear Barry say this decades later, <laughs> is it hard to hear this? You mean, uh, how many, are you asking me politely how many times I wanted to barf during very <laughs> <laughs> uh, Yes, I am asking. Quite a few. <laughs> uh, or are you asking me how, as a prosecutor, could you possibly lose this case? <laughs> no, I, no, on the contrary. I mean, I think that we're going to get to this in a moment with, with, uh, with Mark, because it's not clear to me when Barry says, well, obviously they rejected this and thought that it was a fantasy, I'm saying they may have also thought that it absolutely happened and didn't care. Uh, I can't speak for what went on in the jury room, although I've read Mark's book and I don't have any reason to believe your second scenario was, was the case. Uh, but it was obvious that uh, Barry was going to defend the case by trying to persuade the jury that Getz's tape statements were inaccurate. I felt they were by far the most powerful evidence in the prosecution's arsenal. Um, uh, so my main objective was to corroborate to the extent I could that which Bernie Getz said on the audio tape and the videotape. So uh, I called a lot of witnesses, there was a lot of contradictions, uh, there was corroboration to some degree in what the eyewitnesses recalled and I tried to marshal that as best I could in summation. Um, but Barry did a very effective job of persuading the jurors that there was at least reasonable doubt as to the accuracy of those statements. And uh, I've, I've never, uh, I, I was disappointed by the verdict, but I've never read it as a validation by the jury of what Getz did on December 22nd, back in 1984. I always assumed that there were a number of jurors who were deeply troubled by what went on, but given the jury instructions and our constitutional system of proof beyond a reasonable doubt, I just hadn't met my burden. Well, Mark, can you tell us what happened in the jury room? I mean, was this a case of you know, the, the Judge Crane issued a instruction on juror nullification? He was worried that this thing would happen. He would worry, he worried that no matter what was the presentation of proof, that the feelings, the general feelings outside the courtroom was going to dictate the results inside the courtroom. So is that what happened, or did we actually believe a theory that Getz never actually said that line? We, uh, we were clinging to the medical and ballistical evidence like a lifeline because you had dozens of witnesses that were brought in front of us. 
Some of them had overlapping testimony. Some had contradictory testimony. But nobody disputed that there was this round dent on the subway car next to Daryl Cavey's body. Nobody disputed the ballistic reality of the trajectory of the bullet that caused that dent. And that was a really big piece of evidence for us, as were the... Uh, but can you help me? I'm not sure. sure. I'm not sure exactly what you're saying, that so, the significance of the pattern of the bullet proved what? The trajectory that bullet had to take to make a perfectly circular dent and for the bullet itself to end up in the seat next to Daryl Cavey's body meant it had to be flat because if it was an angle to the metal, there would have been a ricochet and it wouldn't have been a perfect circle. So does that suggest that gets shot further back or does it suggest that he shot close up? It suggested that at least that bullet was shot from where he was initially sitting uh. on the subway, not having moved over at close range and fired a second shot. Right. Um, we also tried to put ourselves in the situation that these other people were in on the subway. You're minding your own business, gunfire suddenly erupts. You know, you're in a panic, and everybody there was. So you're worrying about getting shot yourself. How long is this gonna continue to go on? Can I get to safety? We all assumed that if there had been a significant break and then all of a sudden another shot, that that's something people would have remembered because the safety of the silence had been broken again. And you don't know when it might get broken again in your direction. So we believed that the bullets had been fired in rapid succession. Um, and what that about, was a really important part of his case. So what about Yudowitz's testimony? Because in order to believe that, you also have to believe that he never said that, that he only said it in the videotape. Did the jury concern itself with the statement that they just said, look, we're going to, and look, the 92nd Street, why, how cool is this? We're going all CSI on you here. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but, now, but you, is it all about the trajectory of the bullet, or did they also discount and reject the idea that he had ever said, all right, you look all right, here's a Unlike bullet. everyone else on this stage, I didn't go to law school. Thank so God. So correct me <laughs> if I'm wrong, there was no crime inherent in saying those words, even if he did. It was the issue of how those bullets were fired, not what words were said why. Um, but, but, but let's go back. So to it's a different issue. No, it is a different issue, but Geraldo, you know, one of the things we didn't show in this, I didn't want to go so memory, you know, this is like, you are there, Geraldo Rivera. Uh, but in that segment, you and Barbara Walters get into a little thing. I don't know if you remember this. Uh, Barbara Walters is sort of representing the spirit of the New Yorker where it's a scary city, it's very dangerous, and you step in in a very different way. And, well, and when you hear someone say, I wanted to gouge their eyes out, and I, you look fine, I, here's another. I would, I, the only problem is I didn't have more bullets, if I wish I had more bullets. Well, he had a five-shot, 38, snub nose, loaded with hollow point, illegal gun. He had applied for a gun permit, as I recall, at least two times. He was turned down, made him crazy. But I discount, with all due respect, the niceties of the testimony, the ballistics, with all due respect to Mark. This was, those jurors put themselves in the position of a person on the subway car. They were rooting for Bernard Getz to be acquitted. They were seizing every hook they could get. It was a preordained verdict in my view. They were all Barbara Walters because of the fear that was endemic in this city, because we were gripped in a situation where the criminals ruled, we were sick and tired of our wives and daughters being put in peril every time they went to the store. There was this sense of us against them. There was a sense of, uh, you know, uh, talk about a tale of two cities. This was a tale of two cities. I have no doubt. Uh, this was, this was I'm, I'm telling you, it gives me the, the chills when I, Think of Zimmerman and Trayvon Martin. It's exactly the same parallel. There is uh, this, uh, you can call it jury nullification. They, Greg, with all due respect, had no chance. He had no chance of a conviction 
Bernard Getz sought to convict himself. Maybe they, they would have, he was just bragging. He didn't mean it. Uh, you know, it wasn't that way. I mean, surrounded by four black kids. Oh my God, I was once surrounded by a, a kid asking me for a piece of gum and I, there was no way. Bernard Getz rode the crest of exactly what Barbara Walters expressed that night, the, the crest of we're going to get back at you criminals. You're not going to take this. You're not going to keep this city from us. You're not going to keep my wife scared. You're going to keep my kids scared. Uh, that's the man that we need. We need. He's the Superman. He's the hero. And, uh, you know, uh, the fact that he, he paralyzed that kid at uh, point blank range was almost irrelevant to the vast majority of, of New Yorkers outside of a very small percentage of black moms. Barry, I want to add to that? <clears throat> I met a couple of reverends. One of them was Al Sharpton, and he certainly was out there rooting among his folks. We have a clip of that we'll show you later. And uh, I look forward to it. Well, he doesn't because... look like Al Sharpton anymore. It, no. He used to no. be totally round. <laughs> he was, you measured him by circumference, and you'll see that. Uh -huh. He then doesn't the, look like him. Then there was Floyd Flake, who had a community, a large community who listened to him. Then there was the uh, Daily News. The Getz case was a trial between the Post and the Daily News. <laughs> they, they were able to get to the confessions and see them before I ever got to see them. And they did it. So the fact of the matter is, is that, Geraldo, with all due respect, you've been wrong this time. Mark, you were right. The jury got it. I went through my summation last night. It was six hours, and I read it. If he had 30 bullets, Barry, how many do you think he would have fired? 30. I agree. So, but it didn't happen that way. All right, but, but Greg, let's say it did happen the way Geraldo saw it. He, he observed it. He's a lawyer. He looked at it. He was passionate. Looked at this case. It does get, breed a certain level of cynicism. We saw this in the OJ trial, right? Uh, there's blood everywhere. This is, this is the anti-OJ. <laughs> there's blood everywhere. But the case is really, the verdict really hinges on a referendum about the historic racism of the LA Police Department. So that you have a, a, a largely African American jury who says, yeah, there's blood everywhere. <laughs> but the reality is the white cops of LA hate black people and then we're gonna take it to them this time. And Geraldo's painting a very similar picture. And by the way, so did Barbara Walters in that segment as if to say, you know, this is a runaway jury. This is the, the will of the people. And the question is, you know, you're a prosecutor, your, your job is to keep the state, the, the streets of the city safe. Um, you're in this case, you're in this case prosecuting an urban hero. And I wonder about how, what was that like? Because, you know, the, the public wasn't rooting you on. It may be people who are lawyers were rooting you on or prosecutors, but the public was rooting, rooting for the defendant. Um, it wasn't fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, as I said earlier, um, I, I believe deeply then and now that this is a case that should be tried. Uh, whether the prosecution won or lost was less important to my mind than the facts got out. People could make up their own minds about whether this was a reasonable act by a reasonable person. Um, I did not have delusions about the outcome. I, I was uh, uh, disappointed by some aspects of the verdict, but I can't say I was surprised. But um, uh, when all was said and done and the dust settled, I think it was a just prosecution and I have no quarrel with the outcome. You know, it's interesting, Joel Seidemann, who's outside doing the bar mitzvah thing, uh, <laughs> but if he were here, I would ask him, I have a feeling and I wonder what is the ethics of this. Uh, would, could a DA receive this case and say, you know, I just won't prosecute this case. I just don't, I don't feel it. I feel like these guys got what they deserved. You know, Slotnick will do, will do this soon. I mean, you call them everything in the book. Thugs, punks, hooligans, hoodlums. You couldn't have insulted the victims more, right? Well, they all well, have criminal records. Right, they exactly. Are. Right, to be well, fair. time out. One of them threw a shoe at me as I was cross-examining him. So the jury saw that he was annoyed. We thought he was scratching his foot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but in, in Joel Seidemann's uh, CLE materials, he, there's one really incredible anecdote then when, was it Rensselaer? Is that how his name is pronounced? Ramsour. 
when Ramsur is testifying, you are pissing him off so much, Barry, that the, the court uh, guards are moving closer and closer to him, fearing that he'll get out of the box and come attack you. And what was the impression that it left in the minds of the jurors to think, if this is what it's like in a courtroom with this guy, what would it be like in a subway car with this guy? And that's, you know, in, I mean, I don't know if that was your plan. No, but I had right to be upset, concerned. He threw something at me. He threw a shoe at me. Now, you know, we can all laugh about that, but that's no fun. He did that because it showed the true James Ramsour. Barry, if memory serves me, the, sh the shoe never left his hand. No, it did. It did. I, I mean, mean I, I didn't see it because court officers were <laughs> jumping in front of me so I wouldn't get hit by the shoe. <laughs> <laughs> who was the defendant in that courtroom and who was, uh, you know, who was the problem? Well, look, they were the defendants, or so I made them. Right, right. well, that's and, fair. And there was no question. Exactly. But, but they should have been the defendants. They got shot, so they should have been the defendant. In this case, it's very twisted, right? The victims, the victims mm -hmm. are almost impossible to mm -hmm. treat as uh, witnesses uh, and, and to have their testimony. And in fact, only two of the four testified. Uh, testified. And in Mark's book, Mark says, oh my God, Greg had no choice but to do it, but I wish he hadn't, because by putting them on the mm -hmm. stand, subjecting them to two things. One, their criminal records, which were easily impeaching their credibility. And secondly, they throw shoes, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, they didn't, and he, they're- And they're every, everyone's nightmare also. Right. They're exactly what you're afraid of when you take the number two train. And Greg, did you even consider, you know what, I, 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 have, I can't even put these guys on the stand. Um, the, the first grand jury refused to indict on all charges except the gun charges. Mm, that's right. right. Um, at that point, the case was reassigned to me, and uh, I believe Mr. Morgenthau wanted someone else to take a fresh look at it and decide what, if anything, can be done. Um, and I recommended, and he agreed, that we represented the case to a second grand jury. To be able to do that, however, we had to explain to a judge that there were good reasons, new evidence that wasn't presented to the first grand jury that authorized a representation. So what happened was we made a decision at that point to grant immunity to some of the young men who were shot so that they could testify because none of them had testified before the first grand jury. Um, and that was the new evidence that, uh, that allowed us to seek a second indictment and ultimately led to the second indictment. At that point, I felt I more or less had to call those individuals as witnesses. At least the two I, whom I had immunized, the third, Barry Allen, was not granted immunity, and I did not uh, grant him immunity to testify at the trial, and he therefore had his Fifth Amendment privilege. And Except that he spoke to, to the National Enquirer. Well, that that isn't a waiver of his Fifth Amendment. I understand, right. but the, the he, people... He was, he was the, paid for that, too. Yeah, he was paid 300 bucks, and then the people heard what he really thought, which was the white guy was soft, you know, the guys jumped the turnstile. I mean, they never even paid to get into the subway, right? I mean, every, this is just a disaster, right? They, 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 they ride on the back of a bus <laughs> to get to the subway. They didn't pay for that ride. Then they jumped the turnstile. Now they're inside. Right, and then... And the, then the, the long and the short of it was I, I, I felt I had to call them as witnesses at trial. If I didn't call them as witnesses, Barry could ask and probably would have received a missing witness instruction, which could be devastating. Plus, if I had not called any of those individuals, I can only imagine in Barry's summation how big they would have appeared, right. uh, at least in, in Barry's recreation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what a, what a, one moment. Yeah, yeah. James Rand saw the one that threw the shoe at me. Allegedly. No, no, he, it was an open courtroom. I have witnesses sitting out there. <laughs> he went to jail for, I don't know, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 14 years. For robbery and, and sodomy. Right. That's correct. He took a 17, an 18-year-old woman, brought her to the rooftop of his building with a gun, raped her, and she was in her seventh month, and sodomized her. He was a real good dude. Uh, he also told, ultimately, the police, 
that we were there to rob him. Him, meaning Bernie Getz. He also told the police that uh, we, we were going to hurt him. Why doesn't anybody think about that, Geraldo? That wasn't jury nullification. These were people who were thugs, hoodlums, crooks, Let me bad you, dudes, give the alternate scenario. who committed a crime. Let me propose this scenario. Bernard Getz that day was not an innocent commuter. He was a hunter. He was an urban mm -hmm. hunter. He was just like that, that fire lady in the movies now. What do they call it? Uh, they, that uh, bow and arrow lady. He was seeking <laughs> to eliminate the, the people who were preying on the city. He was looking. If it wasn't those four, it could have been two others, or three others, or one other. Bernard Getz had taken in his mind that he was Superman. He was Charles Bronson. He was the death wish vigilante. He was going to stand up and protect this town from the people that were the cancer on this town that were making it unlivable. He rode that crest of populism to that acquittal, brilliant lawyering that he had. But I, I submit that just like the five white ladies on that Trayvon Martin, George Zimmerman jury put themselves in George Zimmerman's place that night, and they saw that 17-year-old, six-foot, two-inch, hoodie-wearing black kid who looked just like the black kids who had burglarized that complex in Sanford, Florida. They put themselves, they, they, there's no way George Zimmerman would have been convicted. Likewise, there is no way Bernard Getz would have been convicted unless you had tried him in the Bronx with an all-black jury. And even then, you probably would have hung it up. Well, we're actually going to get to that. By the way, if you're watching from the Jewish channel, he was referring, Harada was referring to the Hunger Games. Just, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make sure people watching at home know what we're talking about. Uh, let's get back to, uh, and I wanna, I'm going to actually address this, this idea with, a, with the Bronx jury. Uh, I, I, I let slip the Joel Seidemann question from before. Did you, would you have considered, do you know of a prosecutor in that instance that would have said, I pass? And what is, are there ever consequences to that? Do prosecutors have a choice to say, I just am not feeling this, I don't think it's a right, I don't want to prosecute this particular defendant? You chose not to do that, but could you have chosen, Mr. Morgenthau, sorry, I think these guys got what they deserve? Uh, I, don't, I don't think that would have happened in Manhattan because all of these kinds of cases were presented to a grand jury, even if we thought the grand jury should not return a true bill. At that time, uh, and my guess is it still happens, uh, every time there was a police shooting, whether we as prosecutors believe it was justified or not, we presented the matter to the grand jury, we insisted that the police officer discharged his weapon, waive immunity so he could be prosecuted if the grand jury found his actions were unjustified. So um, under no circumstance can I conceive of this case not having been presented to a grand jury. And, 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 and a prosecutor declining to do it. Uh, that wouldn't have happened in Manhattan. Uh, there are other jurisdictions where I can easily see prosecutors making that decision. And in sex crimes, um, the prosecutor often has to make a very difficult credibility assessment. Oftentimes, these sex crimes are one-on-one -on -one confrontations, and sometimes prosecutors, having uh, vetted the witness, uh, just doesn't feel comfortable uh, and declines at that stage. But with respect to shootings, I think this inevitably would have gone to a grand jury in Manhattan. Mark, let's talk a little about what R Geraldo raised a moment ago. What people don't know, this thing has so much of the earmarks of, of OJ, as, as Geraldo mentioned. So uh, there's now a civil trial in the Bronx uh, after your trial. Your trial has everyone in the Manhattan jury with Mark Leslie is white. Uh, in the Bronx, is no, that true? That's no. not true. Oh, that's not true? At least two blacks and oh, one at least Hispanic. Two. Okay. In, in, uh, but in the Bronx, it was all African-American Hispanic, unless I'm mistaken, entirely. Uh, uh, KB, the, the kid who got shot with the, you look all right, here's another one, who's paralyzed, uh, through the, in the civil case, he receives a, a judgment of $43 million, uh, which I don't think he could collect on with Getz. Um, but it, seemed, it sounds a little like the, the Goldman case, right? Um, by the way, uh, when the Goldmans brought uh, a, a, a civil action against OJ, they too uh, won. By the way, I don't know if you, how many uh, were here, one of our earlier trials and errors, a totally wacky one, 
was the OJ one. Did, you, did anyone come to that? I mean, it was, I'm still recovering from it. <laughs> it was so wacky. I mean, Alan Dershowitz did a caricature of Alan Dershowitz. Uh, it was just, it was absolutely out of control. You would have loved, Dan Abrams played the Geraldo Rivera role, <laughs> okay. and, and Alan did a demonstration, and there was fighting and yelling. It was really unbelievable. It was really entertaining, I'll tell you that. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things that Alan said, because he wouldn't stop talking, but <clears throat> one of the things he said was, he said, look, both verdicts are correct. The verdict in the criminal case is correct, because the prosecution was unable to uh, raise the, the area with guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. And you know, OJ's a killer, and yeah, my client's a killer, and you know, of course, he didn't say he's a killer, but he said yes, and I think it's also correct that the Goldmans received a, a, a judgment for the, un, you know, the unlawful murder and negligence or whatever the claim is in the civil action. Uh, obviously, here, Mark, the exact same thing happened with the jury in the Bronx. Uh, they made a decision that although Bernie Getz was found to be guilty of nothing other than the unlawful possession of a firearm. They held him responsible in civil law uh, for $43 million. Now, for people who are not lawyers, <clears throat> they're thinking, how is that possible? Why shouldn't the verdicts be the same? Why shouldn't the judgment and the verdict be the same? Why does it have such ridiculously disparate outcomes? When you heard the, the, the liability, the, the judgment in the Bronx case, what did you and did you ever call up one of your fellow jurors and say, can you believe this? Uh, no, I never spoke to any of the other jurors about it. I, I did get to speak to Ron Kuby about it. Uh, Ron Kuby represented the KB. I mean, he was essentially the prosecutor, uh, if you will. But I would suggest- He did a better job. Well, <laughs> I, I would suggest that uh, Mr. Getz's attorney in the civil trial was certainly not providing the kind of work that Mr. Slotnick provided him. Thank you. Uh, the, 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 uh, my biggest, uh, I, I hesitate to say disappointment, but uh, if, if I ever had any regret about not doing something, um, if I could have done it in the Getz case, it's this. I would have stood up after I called my last witness and said, Your Honor, the people called Bernard Getz as our last witness. But we can't do that. Yeah. But I believed in my heart of hearts that if Bernie were called as a prosecution witness, he would affirm the accuracy of everything that he said in the audio tape and the videotape, as I believe he did in the civil case where he could be compelled to testify and did in fact affirm, and I think that led in, in large part to the verdict. Barry, would you let would him testify as a prosecution witness? <laughs> would I allow him? Of course not. Okay. All right, well, but, but wait a minute, time out. I'm just asking. I had the worst piece of evidence Someday, in this room, we're going to see the rest of the confession. We're going to, yeah, we're going to watch yeah. some more. I mean, it, it deals with Bernie venting with his anger. I killed them. I shot them. I wish I had more bullets. Yeah, he said that. We just saw him say yeah. that. Yeah. But part, part of the other ones, no, the fact of the matter is, with all due respect, uh, the jury, I wasn't in that room, had to know beyond a reasonable doubt that the case wasn't proven. And the fact of the matter is that it wasn't proven. We put on evidence, I didn't have to. I put on evidence and in a six hour summation, I spent four and a half hours talking about reasonable doubt, the prosecutor's burden, the prosecutor's burden, reasonable doubt. And the jury walked into that jury room and I'm sure they remembered in rapid succession. Why is that so important? This is why it's so important. Because if it was in rapid succession, one, two, three, four, five, it would have been that way. And everybody said it was in rapid succession, except one juror, uh, one witness, who I believe uh, was mistaken, read the daily news, and became a witness as a result of what didn't happen in the subway car. If we had Dr. Udowitz here, or I had his testimony on tape, you would see a very important witness. I have a question for Barry. If Bernard Getz was a black guy and those four thugs were <laughs> white guys, do you think there would have been the same result? Hey, by the way, white guys with criminal records? Yes. Thugs, same. hoodlums. Yeah, same. thugs. I mean, Punks. Same exact. You could have said the I same. Mean, they people they like changed the race of the participants. People, but, and they were like because uh, the people that were. Was the 13th juror 
in Simpson, what, what Dershowitz, mm -hmm. Professor Dershowitz, our dear friend, Arthur Adel mm -hmm. in the audience with me, uh, what, what he and the Dream Team saw was the gigantic gap in this country between black people and white people. He saw the racial divide, and they rode an express train through it. And with all due respect, the same thing happened in the subway vigilante in the Bernhard Getz case, and the same thing happened in George Zimmerman and, and Trayvon Martin. And that was the ghost that overwhelmed everything. It came to define who New York was. Bloomberg, I think, has done a lot to uh, mitigate that raw emotion. I think we may, you know, the jury is out on what happens now with this new administration, but I think that Americans have to cop to that reality that this is a nation riven by race. And this case came to express all of the pent up anxieties, all of the anger that was dividing black people and white people in this country. You know, in picking a jury, Geraldo. Hold on one second, just get ready to show clip four. We'll come to it in a second. But. In picking a jury, the first set of selections took place in the judges' chambers every Friday. Now, why was it every Friday? I was on trial in a case called USA against Gotti. Uh, I couldn't be uh, in the state Supreme Court trying gets. The Daily News and the New York Times said, if Slotnick's too busy to try this case, we need a response. Let him give it up. So the judge said, every Friday, we will come and speak to jurors. And we did. Every Friday, I spoke to jurors. And there were jurors who said, in the same morning that the Amsterdam News said, if you're picked up for the jury, tell them you know nothing. And there were jurors that came and said, oh, Bernard Getz, who's that? We don't know who he is. We know nothing. And I, I remember looking at one witness and, as a juror, and they weren't going to sit on that jury. And I took Bernie's head and I put it between these two fingers and I said, have you seen this face? Do you know what he looks like? Oh, I've never seen that face before. Hey. There were, there were communities that were riding each other. You, now, you got do I say- You got whites on a jury in Manhattan, that ain't bad. Do, but do, did I say, and it may be that it worked. It worked. He was a great prosecutor. You lost the case because you couldn't prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. That's the only reason you lost the case. You lost the case because we had witnesses. We had Udowitz, a Ramser, uh, the, the kind, nice man who rapes uh, women uh, on his rooftops at gunpoint when they're in their seventh month. Um, Alan, one of the other nice kids uh, who had a record yay long. Uh, all so terrible. They were thugs. They were hoodlums. And you know what? When you play segment four and the rest of it, these people, if they only saw that and didn't see the psychologists, the people who would say, that never happened, would convict okay. Bernie. Uh, one, before we play the clip, Barry, uh, uh, Greg, uh, was there ever an, a discussion, an issue, uh, 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 a uh, motion, an argument before the court to exclude this tape? Uh, did Getz receive Miranda warnings? He voluntarily did the interview. How did this happen? He, you were not- We never, we, we, I never moved to exclude that no, tape. No, but why not? Because that, why the not? only evidence that Greg had was that incredibly Because I wanted to win the case. And I knew that his tape confession, <clears throat> as damaging as it was, hit by other evidence, would show the jury that no guilt was proven beyond a reasonable doubt. I had a question for Geraldo. You, you had uh, asked a, a few moments ago, how would this have played out if Getz had been a black man and the four teenagers had been white. My question to you is, would Carl Rowan have written the op-ed piece in the New York Times that he wrote if that had been the case? Fair point, fair point. People chose up sides. And the prosecutor had the, the short end of the stick. He was representing, uh, he, you, he had no constituency mm -hmm. south of 125th Street. All right, let's watch uh, clip number four. This is more Getz in New Hampshire during this interview. Uh, I've heard things said about me that I was uncivilized. Okay, I acted in an uncivilized way. And the most, if you think this is vicious, if you knew what was in my mind, the most vicious thing that I can think of is the person who said that. I wish that 
they were sitting there in that seat. And it is unbearable for people to live in fear. People must have police protection. The, the problem isn't the police. The problem is you. It's your legal system. The legal system is a sham. Huh. Um, let's talk about stop and frisk. Um, you know, Joel Seidemann in the CLE materials points out that after 20 years of Republican mayoral mayors, and in a stunning decline in urban crime, we now had the luxury to now vote for a progressive, an avowed progressive, that they allowed us to feel safe enough in New York City to say things like, oh, stop and frisk is a terrible thing. By the way, during the Getz case, right, if people had said there's this technique called stop and frisk, everyone would have said, please, anything. You know, frisk everybody. <laughs> Again. Uh, you know, people, you know, believe me, I'm a law professor, so I know how smug people can be, you know, and if you don't go outside, people say a lot of things, what you'd say differently if you went outside. Uh, you know, so you can have very different feelings about, well, how do you feel about terrorism, you know, and what should people do about terrorism until you say, I don't want to go into a building and have it blown up, and I'm willing to sacrifice some of my personal liberties, and there is no question that for years we sacrificed a number of our personal liberties because every year the statistics went down and we couldn't believe it. We we're like, can we go to zero murders, right? The, one of the, lar the largest city in the world, we have zero murders. I was like, we can't even believe it. I still can't believe the statistic when Joel said it's only 300, that we were at 2,500. At, it peaked at 2,500. With, uh, during the era of Getz, it was 1,500. I remember, and rising. And, and rising, yeah. I remember, it wasn't long ago, was it 1990? Joel mentions it in the CLE materials when that family from uh, Utah had come to the... In the subway. In the subway. They had come to see the United States open, the tennis uh, uh, open, and the, the, the same similar situation, a number of kids, they knock the mother down, they kick her in the face, they rip the wallet out of the uh, father, the boy goes to help the mother, and they shoot and kill the, the son. Uh, it's only 1990. Uh, 1990, there was no Giuliani, there was no Bratton, there was no Kelly, there was no stop and frisk. And you had instead a community saying, help us, anything. And so is the, get, is the Getz case for you, I think it's a cautionary tale. You say, well, let's, let's be careful where we go because this is how we got to the point where we, we, res we started to resent stop and frisk. I come from a kind of a, a unique perspective in the sense that as you know, as Joel was kindly pointed out, I started in the New York DA's office and then was a legal services attorney. And re my office was 116th Street and 8th Avenue. And I, so those, those moms were my clients up, up there. Uh, so I, I developed a, a sense of, uh, you know, are they being victimized by the police? Are they, uh, you know, is, is the world unfair? And then as I got older and had my own children and my children were hanging out and some of them got stuck up or some of them got busted for this or that, uh, you know, pot this or that, you, ha you have a situation where you watch the ja a gradual deterioration of civility in the city. 77 was really the, 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 the nadir of, uh, of, of New York. Was that when the Bronx was burning? It was the Bronx was burning, the Summer of Sam. Right. Uh, uh, it, was, it was just sheer anarchy. And there really was a, a question mark in many people's minds as to whether or not, and neighborhoods like this one were shrinking. Uh, you know, uh, it, now you have gentrification all the way up to 116th Street on the east side. Uh, I just saw uh, on Lenox Avenue a, a penthouse uh, on the market for $4 million. In this period, this neighborhood was shrinking. It, 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 the, uh, the urban malignancy had come south of 96th Street. Uh, there was a, a sense of embattlement. The private schools all had a hyper security. There was a, the, a sense of siege that, uh, and, and so attitudes like mine, really progressive attitudes, began to evolve. And then you, your instinct becomes, okay, uh, you know, I want fair play, I want equal justice for all. On the other hand, I don't want my kids to get stuck up. On the other hand, my apartment's been burglarized four times this year. So then you start to believe that, uh, you know, I cannot emphasize strongly enough 
how beloved of white people and middle class people Bernard Getz was. It wasn't just the Daily News against the New York Post. It was a, it was a us against them. It was finally we have someone who has the balls to stand up and, and stand in front of our, our you know, uh, uh, beleaguered community and protect us, do something the cops wouldn't. Benjamin Ward, the police commissioner, wasn't he a police commissioner yeah. then, a black guy? Uh, you know, he was re widely regarded as ineffective. Uh, Koch hadn't gotten uh, his, uh, you know, he hadn't become the, the man, how am I doing guy that he ultimately became as the 80s progressed and things got more prosperous nationally and and the safety net took hold it was it was a different time there and 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 uh, you know it's uh, it's something that is fascinating to see from the perspective of 330 murders now where do we go from here I, I think that there's much more civility there's much more uh, uh, community pressure for people to obey the rules. New York is unique in that way. Uh, you know, look at Williamsburg. What was William Williamsburg? You wouldn't walk in Williamsburg in those days. Look at central Brooklyn. Uh, you know, the neighborhoods now with Bushwick and Greenpoint and all these neighborhoods that are now uh, with two million dollar condos and, and, and cafe latte bars. <laughs> I mean, in those days, you'd, uh, you know, there'd, there'd be a dead body in the uh, alleyway and be sitting there for a couple hours before they picked it up. Uh, let me just add to this. It's, we're not actually taking questions from the audience yet, but I can't resist this one. This one for our, from, from here, not from our audiences at home. Uh, before, the de Bla, before de Blasio in the era of Bloomberg stop and frisk, in quotes, uh, I would never dream of carrying my pistol in New York City. Uh, but now I would, with an underlined would, consider uh, carrying for my own protection and then this person goes on to say, do you do, do believe the weakening of random stops will lead to more gun violence? Uh, Geraldo thinks we're living in a very different New York City, uh, but I'm wondering if anyone else has any response that when they hear stop and frisk, they say, please don't take us back to the 80s. Now, one, one of the clips I didn't show, um, but it's long, although it's so precious, it was also, it was on your show, Koch. And Mayor Koch is on the show, and he says, oh, I'm a victim of crime, and I, I would want to kill a person who did that. And this is the mayor saying, I would kill a person who, you know, I felt very victimized and traumatized by it, and I feel, I under exactly understand. And it's interesting, it's almost as if he said, well, this is where the votes are, right? The votes are to say lawlessness works, and he, he literally admits on your show, he says, people lose faith in our institutions. Barbara Walter says, including the mayor. She goes, yeah, I get it, I get it. They lose faith in everybody who works for the city, and that's why they rely and resort to vigilante frontier justice. Um, but does anyone like this guest, one of our audience members, feel similarly uh, that uh, stop and frisk meant something and that we've now taken, we've taken the, 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 the commitment to fighting violent crime is now softer than it once was. All I can say is everyone is watching those statistics with eagle eyes. There were four homicides in three days right as the year began and the new de Blasio administration had just been sworn in. Uh, and everyone is in a, a real conundrum because we want civil liberties, we want equal treatment, but the last thing we want is for kids to start packing. And there's no doubt, in my mind at least, that stop and frisk was an invaluable tool. I think that Ray Kelly, it was, it was absolutely appalling to me how disrespectful the de Blasio administration has been to Commissioner Kelly, a true American hero. It is, it, the, the way they disrespected Michael Bloomberg at the inauguration of the new mayor was absolutely appalling bad manners. They are looking at the two men most responsible, uh, along with Rudy Giuliani, uh, of giving us a generation of relative tranquility, made this the greatest city. There is a reason why, uh, you know, for all of the talk now and the President's State of the Union will be about income inequality and injustice and all the rest of it, there's no doubt that this is a place where a, a black teenager has a much better shot at becoming a, a, a middle class or upwardly mobile uh, black adult than he did in 1984. And I think you can, you can uh, in that regard, you can credit what they've done here, what Bloomberg and Kelly did. 
And uh, Bratton was a great guy. I mean, I like the, I, terrific, I'm glad he's back. Uh, the fact that he was packing a gun and wouldn't take a subway without a gun, that's very telling. You know, nowadays, uh, you know, I've got teenagers that take the subway all the time. That was unthinkable in those days. You know, you wouldn't even let your kid walk across the street to school unless they were escorted by a, by a grown-up or in groups. This is, a, this is a much, much different town. Just think of a place like Chicago, a civilized, functioning, world-class uh, city with three times the homicides we have here. Why? Because they didn't have stop and frisk, and we did, I think. Mm -hmm. Anyone want to step in in either, in either way for, on, in favor of stop and frisk? Because this, th this reunion of the Getz case is clearly, it's so nice and timely. It's not just revives our thinking about Trayvon Martin uh, and the OJ trial, but it also makes us think that, uh, you know. Well, Bernard Getz would not, not have been stopped and he would not have been frisked. I mean, that's a reality. It's another reality. He just wouldn't have been. I mean, uh, that's another fact of the matter. Those How sad kids, it kids. is that we reduce ourselves down to racism at this point. We were here to discuss the trial of Bernard Getz. Bernard Getz was acquitted by a jury that found the prosecution had not proven the evidence, the case against them beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's what happened. And he was let to go home. And it's nothing to do with the community or anything else. Well, it was the fact that he tried a great case. But at the end of the day, the evidence he had bounced back and it didn't work. Let's look at, let's take a look also, at, uh, guys, you get ready for a clip five. Let's take a look at everything that we just heard between Barry and Geraldo will be interesting. Watch, watch this. This is the last clip that we're going to see. What you have here is nothing more than a vicious rat. That's all it is. It's not Clint Eastwood. It's not, uh, who's this guy who's shooting around people and, uh, that one movie, Death Wish, whatever it was. It's not that, like what Koch said. It's not... It's not taking the law in your own hands. You can label that. It's not being judge, trial, judge, jury, and uh, executioner. What this, what, what this, what this is, what this is. Listen, I'm going to tell you what it is, and you won't understand. This is survival instinct. While the Getz case was a question of self-defense, civil rights activists said the verdict of ten white jurors and two blacks was racist. No decision in the early 60s in Mississippi, Alabama would have been as racist as this. I think that we have given license to people now to shoot and say they thought they were getting robbed. Don't even prove it, but that we think we're getting robbed. And it's a bad sign for the criminals in this town, finally, because now when they prey upon somebody, they're going to have to think twice and they may have an x lax attack. Remember those guys in the subway? <laughs> And, I mean, really, Al Sharpton looks so good now. <laughs> Look mean, how young they got. I know. <laughs> you know, every, I'm listening to Geraldo, and I'm just thinking, oh, my God, yeah, I mean, we, I, when I was a graduate student, you know, as a kid growing up, nobody went anywhere. Uh, you know, we were all, in some ways, prisoners of our homes, and an entire generation forgot that era. You know, Mark, when you hear all of this, do you think to yourself, I know that Joel mentioned it before, that I think in your book you said, you know, I'm resentful that people would say that we created open season on black kids, that we weren't able to be intelligent, thoughtful people that evaluated the evidence and listened to these two fine lawyers and came to a judgment, uh, and that this was not a racist verdict, but this was a verdict that's based on the presentation of evidence. I was accused of being a racist by some of my closest friends after this trial. Um, I got a phone call tonight from a guy, one guy I almost got in a fist fight with over it. Back in that time? Yeah, yeah. I mean, immediately after the trial. Did um, he know you're a martial arts expert? Um, <laughs> he's a fellow martial oh, arts okay. expert <laughs> at the same school. Actually. Those are the only guys who do this um, to you, right? <laughs> the reason I wrote the book was not to make money. It was because I wanted people who are interested in knowing why we came to the decision we did to have a chance to understand it the way I did. 
Um, and again, we never felt that what we were ruling put a stamp of approval on what happened on that subway car. We determined that it hadn't been proven to us he wasn't justified, which is different than deciding he was justified. And it may seem a slender legal thread, but I think it's a pretty significant one. Barry, sum it up for us. Uh, we live in a country that was born out of strife. We live in a great country. Uh, we have said to prosecutors, you want to prosecute somebody? You have to prove their guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. They have the burden. And that's what this was all about. Yes, can you infuse racism? Of course you can. I saw the Zimmerman trial. I know what that was about. There was no case to begin with. He shouldn't have been prosecuted. But it was forced upon the people. The fact of the matter is, in this case, at the end of all that testimony, at the end of all the theories, it came out that this juror and this jury believed Bernard Goetz had not done anything wrong and had not been proven to do anything wrong beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's the end. All right, before we thank our guests and send them home, a couple brief announcements, and then we'll set, send our home with a, with a round of applause. Uh, the first is if you are receiving CLE credit for tonight's Trials and Errors, you have to go to the table outside on the right to sign out that you were here at the end, uh, and then your certificate will be emailed to you. All right, so just please, that's the, how it's done in order to certify the credits. Uh, also, um, our next Trials and Errors event is on March 13, and it's uh, the 25th anniversary of the case between uh, Larry Flint and Hustler Magazine's First Amendment obscenity case before the Supreme Court, and yes, we're having Larry Flint. Uh, so we'll have a, another incredibly uh, entertaining, as you know, uh, Trials and Errors. I want to thank our guests, Barry Slotnick, uh, Mark Lacey, uh, uh, Greg w Waples, and Geraldo Rivera.